All right. We are gaveling in. We are gaveling in uh, this meeting of education finance. Uh, Chair Joachim will be presenting the first bill. Um, uh, Vice Chair Clarity is uh, uh, unable to be with us in person this week. Um, and so I'm going to start start the meeting. Thank you all for listening. Um, appreciate that. Um, with that, I do uh, call uh, this meeting of education finance uh, to order. Uh, we have a quorum present. Our first order of business is to approve the minutes. And uh, Representative Hill, I believe you've had a moment to uh, review the minutes, and you do have a cor technical correction for us. Yeah, a real simple technical correction. Thank you, Chair Pryor. Um, the elementary school mentioned in the minutes is uh, actually Maxfield Elementary, not Maxwell. And so if we could make that update, I would move their approval. All right. Thank you, Representative Hill. And with that, um, any other discussion of the minutes of February 2nd, 2023? Uh, Representative Bennett. Thanks, Madam Chair. And, and not the minutes, but Madam Chair, you had me kind of a deja vu moment for a minute. I thought we had been transported in time to this afternoon. And so uh, thank you for clarifying that it is morning and this is Ed Finance. So. Yep, yep. Thank you me. are in the correct place at the correct time. It's just me that's wrong. And I, I appreciate your indulgence all. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, Representative Bennett, for making sure we're all on the same page this morning. Um, any discussion of the minutes as with this technical correction. All right, with that, um, all in favor of approving the minutes as corrected, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. And with that, we have uh, the minutes of February 2nd. Um, our first order of business is House File 1259. Um, and um, now I'm here, yes. <laughs> and Chair Joachim, would you like to move your bill before the committee with the intention to re-refer the bill to the Committee on Taxes? Um, thank you, Madam Chair, I would. All right, um, and uh, please go ahead and present your bill, uh, Chair Joachim. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Madam Chair, you can never be wrong, so <laughs> that is okay. Um, thank you for hearing 1259 today. It's a, it removes obsolete language, obsolete and, uh, aid calculation that was last applied in fiscal year 2004. That's why it has to go to taxes. This is a basic bill that we'll be sending to taxes and on to ways and means. For those of you who have been around for a while, this is our vehicle bill. So I stand for questions. All right. Uh, seeing no questions at this point, uh, uh, I think you kind of covered uh, what our order of business here, Chair Um Thank you. And uh, with that, if it's appropriate, then I will, uh, we will, um, Chair Joachim renews her motion that House File 1259 um, to be re-referred to the Committee on Taxes. Um, with that, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, with that, um, this uh, bill is re-referred to taxes. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair Joachim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members, for your indulgence this morning. Um, next up, we have House File 877, uh, Representative Hill. Let me get myself adjusted here. Representative Hill, uh, welcome to your committee. Would you like to move that House File 877 before the committee with the intention to lay the bill over for possible inclusion in the Education Finance Bill? Would like to do that, to move it forward. All right, so we have House File 877 before us. Um, Representative Hill, why don't you go ahead and introduce your bill? Thank you, Chair Joachim. Members of the committee, I'm here to speak to Bill uh, House File 877, uh, which is known as the Transportation Sparsity Revenue uh, Bill. This is a bill that has uh, been in place over time. Approximately 25 years ago, we saw the metric that was utilized to fund transportation in our larger geographic districts uh, really begin to take a toll. And over time, a uh, bill that's been uh, often carried by uh, former representative uh, Bob Detmer uh, from Forest Lake uh, and has uh, generated and uh, brought a lot of uh, support around it. Here's uh, the gist of it. 
We have school districts around. Um, Representative Hill, can you move the microphone a little bit closer? I'm happy to. to. Yep. Thank you. Uh, around Minnesota, as you know, we have school districts of various shapes and sizes. And this is a bill um, that takes a look at the number of students that a school district serves uh, per square mile that is found within the boundaries of that school district. And our hope here would be uh, to support our school districts that are transporting students further. Uh, thereby uh, incurring greater costs. Uh, I would like uh, to move uh, into you know, hearing some of our uh, testimony. We have some experts uh, around this bill and what uh, the, the support uh, has meant to them in the past. And our hope is, is to increase that support to keep up with uh, higher fuel costs, et cetera, uh, to support this work. So Madam Chair, if I could, uh, I'd like to call uh, our, our testimony uh, providers Dr. Steve Massey, uh, followed by Dr. Michael Funk, who has brought with him Operations Director Mark Drummerhausen, and also Superintendent Olson from Bemidji Schools. Thank you, Representative Hill. Um, with that, why doesn't we have Dr. Steve Massey and Dr. Michael Funk, why don't you come on up to the uh, table and introduce yourself for the record. And uh, Dr. Massey, you can proceed. Oh, Representative Hill, you have to actually stay at the microphone. Okay. So the other one can sit. Sorry about that. <laughs> Little weird protocol we have here. Back to Massey, proceed. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, representative, members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity this morning to testify on behalf of House File 877. Uh, representative Hill, thank you for your leadership on this critical issue. Uh, I think you referenced that I might be an expert. I'm not so sure about that, but I'm certainly uh, extremely passionate about this issue. Uh, briefly, the issue, the issues related to school transportation funding inequities go all the way back to 1995 when the legislature changed transportation funding to a per pupil basis rather than a metric that covered the real costs incurred by districts to transport students. Transportation sparsity aid was added to help districts that were negatively impacted by this change. Today, the sparsity formula covers only 18.2% of districts' transportation deficits. Forest Lake Area Schools is a district just 25 miles north of St. Paul, Minneapolis. Our district covers approximately 220 square miles with an enrollment of just under 6,000 students. On an average day, our 82 buses cover a two-tiered system and as a total, drive over 5,500 miles each day. This is the distance between Key West to Anchorage every day. As I stated a moment ago, transportation is based on student enrollment, not the miles a district must drive to transport students. Consequently, districts with a large geography and a dispersed housing, like Forest Lake and many other similar districts, must offset their transportation costs from the general fund. Spe specifically, Forest Lake draws approximately $500,000 from the general fund every year to cover this transportation deficit. To offset this cost, we have reduced eight routes in the last two years, resulting in longer bus routes for students. We now have some students that ride the bus for close to two hours each day. The issue is an issue of fairness and equity. Half a million dollars is equivalent to eight teachers or critical services we are not able to provide for our students. House File 877 specifically calls for an increase in the supplemental transportation sparsity rate from 18.2% to 70%. This increase is consistent with the recommendation from the Governor's School Finance Working Group, of which I was a member. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I would be happy to answer any questions after my colleagues from Bemidji and Stillwater testify. Thank you, Dr. Massey. Um, next up, we have Dr. Michael Funk from Stillwater Area Schools. Good morning. Uh, I am Mike Funk from Stillwater. I've been superintendent there since July. Previously, I was a superintendent at Albert Lee for 13 years. So 
sparsity. Um, aid is something that uh, I'm quite familiar with, being from outstate Minnesota originally, and now being in a large uh, geographically um, diverse district, it has in Stillwater. Our district, um, from north to south, is over 25 miles long. So again, uh, just as uh, Dr. Massey was talking about with Forest Lake, we share some of the similar concerns. We have about 120 buses that we run on a daily basis, and we run three tiers. And uh, not only do we transport our students, but we transport a, a number of private schools and, and charter schools within the district as well. As you are all aware um, from what you have read over the, or seen over the past few years, Inflation has been a uh, significant, had a significant impact on district operations. It has on operations, you know, globally, I think it has. We have, uh, particularly within the area of transportation, have a sh shortage of drivers that we have been dealing with um, primarily because we can't afford them. Um, also, fuel prices have gone up significantly, and yet, you know, we, we receive similar sparsity aid that we have for years and years and years. So as a result of that, the district is having to, to make um, adjustments in some areas um, so that uh, those adjustments are impacting kids. For example, as I mentioned, we have students as far south as Afton and as far north as Marina and St. Croix. We used to run activity buses for those students and provide transportation so that they could be in programs after school. Um, we can't do that anymore because we, we can't afford it. And as a result, uh, we've eliminated those services and we've impacted the equity of opportunity for a number of our students. Uh, we also have some special elementary programs that we run in the district. We've got a gate program um, for gifted and talented and we have a Spanish immersion program. And we are having um, a hard time trying to figure out how we are going to continue to offer the, the gate funding that we have for transportation. And, uh, you know, we would like to expand it to our uh, Spanish immersion program, but, but frankly we can't because of the um, increased costs that we're associated with. So I, I just want to emphasize today how if, you know, this House File 877, which I'm completely in support of, worked were to pass, this wouldn't be additional dollars flown in for extra services. We would be re restoring some basic services in Albert Lee, or excuse me, Stillwater, um, <laughs> that, uh, uh, that we uh, have had to cut over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Funkin. As a proud alum of Stillwater with uh, na nephews and a niece there right now. Thank you. Um, next up, we have... Um, Dr. Uh, Jeremy Olson, Superintendent of Bemidji Area Schools. And I have been up to visit your uh, bus area before and know your challenges. Please uh, state your name for the record. Proceed. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Jeremy Olson. I'm the Superintendent of Bemidji Area Schools. I uh, want to thank you all for being here and the important work that you do on behalf of education. It is appreciated. We do recognize and see that from people from the superintendents principals, teachers, we do understand the, the important work you guys do. So thank you for having us here today. Um, I'm here to talk to you obviously about House File 877 and I want to also thank um, Representative Hill for the, the work to bring this forward. This is an important issue and is an important issue that just gets larger and larger as we see fuel prices rise, as we see the cost of uh, buses rise and so forth. The Majiri Schools uh, serves approximately 4,800 students, uh, pre-K through grade 12. We provide transportation services for a lot of schools. So we provide transportation services for 20 different school sites over 825 square miles. We provide 11 uh, transportation services to 11 public schools, a juvenile detention center, four charter schools, and four private schools. I want you to keep that in mind because Bemidji is unique in that we have charter schools and private schools that we service for transportation. However, when the, expenditure, the expenditures outweigh the revenues, it is not the charter schools, it's not the private schools that pay for that. It comes out of public school educational aid. So we transfer dollars from public schools to pay for transportation to supplement private school and charter transportation as well. So I just want to make sure that point is, hits home with you, that 
Public schools are the ones that are responsible for providing transportation. Therefore, when, the when we have a deficit across subsidy here in transportation, it is public schools that bear the brunt of that. And we're, we're coming to you with a solution with House File 877 to help uh, remedy that, or at least partially remedy that. Um, I want, there's a map in the, a, of a district overlay of the metro um, that shows Bemidji area schools and what that looks like. And just to give you an understanding of how large our district is and why we have to run the transportation that we do. If you look at that map, you will notice that the boundaries of Bemidji area school district encompass 825 square miles, which is, by the way, just for reference, two thirds of the size of the state of Rhode Island. So just think about that, two thirds, if we were in Rhode Island, we, our district would make up two thirds of that state just in transportation area. As we overlay the map on the district uh, toward the metro, it stretches from Albertville, if we were to overlay Bemidji, Albertville to Rosemont. Well, the city of Bemidji proper is about the size of the Richfield School District. However, even though we are much larger in transportation area than Richfield, our, tra our student population is about the same which is why we have to run much farther and run a lot more buses because we just have inefficiencies built in with that kind of square mileage. The issue is that we have a much larger transportation footprint and we are on par with the enrollment of Richfield. Since transportation is paid out by enrollment and not miles driven, the Midgey's transportation costs per student will be much larger as we are required to transport our student population much further. In essence, this means more bus routes, more fuel, more personnel, and more miles on our buses. Keeping in mind that as diesel prices increase, it disproportionately hurts the Majiri schools. Because we are such a large district and we have students living in such a sparsely, uh, sparsely populated area, we end up driving so many more miles per student than tightly populated urban school districts. The standard funding formula is not enough for us in Bemidji, and we run a deficit anywhere from $430,000 a year to $1.1 million a year. I also want to point out that where we have that 430,000 and some of those lower dollar amounts, that was not a result of our need going down. That was a result of us not running school the entire year because we would have shutdowns and so forth for COVID. So that's artificially lowered there. Our, if you look at our historical uh, deficit, we're about a million dollars per year. that are going again from public schools to, to fund transportation for all schools. Uh, charter and private schools do not have to transfer this funding from their educational programs, as is the public school's responsibility to provide transportation. Public schools should not have to use general fund classroom dollars just to get kids to school. We believe in getting kids to school, don't get me wrong. But we believe that we should also, because this is a mandate by the state, we believe that the state should provide a fix. Along with keeping money out of the classroom, we find ourselves unable to keep our bus purchase rotation up to date due to these funding losses while also driving 1.2 million miles per year. Currently, we are purchasing only two buses for replacement. This isn't enough, this is not sustainable. We can't drive buses for 35 years. We need to look at a solution that will be sustainable over time and ensure that we can continue to provide this important service to parents. We know that during the pandemic, we had limited busing that put a strain on parents. We know how important this service is. The transportation funding formula is simply not working for Bemidji schools and we are asking for your support through House File 877 so that school districts like Forest Lake, Bemidji, and several other districts can be made whole. We are required to provide transportation for all schools in our district, including charter and private schools, and I would ask that we be provided the funding to fulfill this mandate instead of taking it out of public school education dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Olson. Um, with that, members, I'm gonna just quick make a note that you have a fiscal note in your folder on this bill, and then also I'm going to have Mr. Strom go over uh, how to read the runs that are with this bill as well, just as a refresher. Mr. Strom? Madam Chair, members, thank you. Uh, if you have questions on the fiscal note, please direct those to Ms. Beckel. In terms of the printout, there's an estimated uh, printout uh, uh, landscape on your page that shows district's current transportation sparsity revenue. Um, it's, it's basically a printout that's laid out in our usual way in school district order. So for example, on the first page, uh, the Bemidji School District is number 31, and you can see the numbers across for Bemidji. Um, the two districts from Washington County are in the 830s, and you can look there for their information. 
but to use Bemidji as an example, you can see that they're estimated to have 5,099 pupils next year. The baseline transportation sparsity revenue is expected to be about $1 million, presuming no changes, which is about $200 per pupil unit. The next two columns show the estimated, uh, for the current year, the estimated transportation expenditures. Uh, and you can see there, but for, the, for this year, for Bemidji, that would be $3.7 million is the current estimate. And the current transportation revenue, uh, uh, which includes some of the general fund revenue in terms of how we make that calculation, of $2.9 million. So you see the unfunded difference there is currently, in the next column, over $774,000 uh, uh, for the Bemidji School District. Of that amount, currently $140,000 is being reimbursed through the 18.2% reimbursement level. Under House File 877, the next column shows that that amount would increase to $542,000. So that the second to last column shows an increase in revenue for the Bemidji School District of $400,000, or roughly $80 per pupil unit. As the superintendent mentioned, these are estimated numbers. There are reasons like the uh, um, they, they go into the uh, uh, calculations that may change because of things of a school shutdown or increased costs that a district may face. Uh, the February forecast will update these amounts, uh, but until that time, this is our best guess for fiscal year 24. So then if you look at the top, just very quickly, you can see that on an aid entitlement basis, this change would cost about $12.36 million, and you can see the kinds of districts by strata that would benefit for the bill. So Madam Chair, in, in summary, that's a quick overview of the printout. Thank you, Mr. Strom. Um, members, I think I'll go to questions unless you want Ms. Beckel to go over. Ms. Beckel, why don't you just quickly go over the fiscal note too. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Solve Beckel, House Fiscal. Um, yes, uh, the fiscal note just shows the appropriations um, for this um, that match uh, to what Mr. Strom just laid out. Mr. Strom um, went over the numbers for fiscal year 24, and he was um, talking about entitlement numbers. So if you're looking to match the numbers in the fiscal note to what Mr. Strom just discussed, if you look at the top of page three of that fiscal note, um, uh, the line that says transportation sparsity, um, that first column to the right of it there, where it says 12,366,212, that almost perfectly matches Mr. Strom's number under the column HF877 new revenue uh, total. Um, so that is the uh, entitlement amount um, that uh, for fiscal year 24, and then you can see the entitlement amounts for fiscal years 25, 26, and 27. Of course, um, with uh, many education um, appropriations, those are uh, split, or what we call 90-10. Um, so then if you look farther down on the fiscal note, um, on page three, you can see the appropriation amounts where you take 90% of the current year payment of, that, of the entitlement and then 10% of the prior year. So we only see 90% of the amount in fiscal year 24. Um, and that's where you get the appropriation amounts um, that you see on the bottom line there and then that appear on the front of the fiscal note to get the total costs of this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Beckel, and uh, Representative Hill, thank you for letting us uh, do a little bit of housekeeping and background on this. Um, with that, members, I'm going to go to member questions for testifiers. Representative Edelson. Oh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Hill. This is such a, a great bill, and, and when I think of education finance, it's, it's literally because of things like this. Um, I know this has been an issue that... Um, Represent Representative Edelson, can you pull the microphone a little bit? There you go. Thank oh, is you. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. Um, I know this has been an issue that, that has been going through the legislature for years um, and how frustrating as I'm looking at the runs, which are very helpful. Um, thank you, Mr. Strom. Um, for Forest Lake, uh, Stillwater, 
I mean, still water, wow, 1 point, uh, almost 1.5. That, that's a big deal. Um, I guess I, with the um, uh, going to Stillwater, uh, Dr. Funk, if you uh, you said you had cut some of the after school pro pro programming because of of these numbers, and I guess I'm curious uh, with this funding that we would have in this appropriation, would that allow you to restart um, those after school programs? That would be our Dr. intent. Dr. At this Dr. Point. Funk, can you state your name for the record again, please? Dr. Sorry, <laughs> Dr. Mike Funk, Superintendent Stillwater. That would be the uh, the intent. Um, to start to bring us whole again for, again, it's an equity issue. Um, we have kids who live, you know, 20 some miles from maybe their school and asking them to have their parents transport um, when kids who live maybe a few blocks or a mile or two, it, it's a significant family difference. So that would be our intent, Representative. Thank you. Representative Edelson, follow up? Uh, no, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Dr. Funk, I was uh, bused from Craywood to Oakdale every day, so I know that feeling. Um, members, any other questions? Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to thank Representative Hill for bringing this forward. Um, this is a very important issue. I think it's bipartisan. Um, I think um, we all understand it's not fair to um, at all to, to, to harm students just because their school district has a large geography. Um, right now, we're taking dollars out of um, out of education, out of the classroom, um, to fund transportation, and uh, I wholeheartedly support this bill. And again, I want to thank Representative Hale for all your hard work on this. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Anderson. With that, uh, Representative Hill, final comments on your bill. Yeah, thanks, Chair Yuakim, and, and um, thank you to our um, colleagues that they came in from around the state to provide their testimony on this this important bill uh, you just hit the nail on the head uh, representative Anderson that this does uh, take dollars out of the classroom and what our intent here with house file 877 is is to uh, put some of those uh, dollars back where um, they belong in service to our students and families uh, I was one who benefited from activities buses uh, when I was a, a middle schooler and I know it's hard to imagine, but I, I at one time played basketball, uh, and that was only possible because there was an activities bus, and um, met my best friend through that experience. Um, as, as we move forward, I think that uh, Superintendent Massey put it uh, brilliantly and succinctly, this is an issue of fairness and equity, and uh, I would urge your support of House File 877. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative Hill. With that, the chair lays over House File 877 for possible inclusion in an education finance bill. Um, next up, we have House File 994. Representative Bird. Thank you, Representative Bird. Um, I will move House File 994 before the committee today with the intention of laying over the bill for possible inclusion in the education finance bill. Um, Representative Berg, go ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Uh, Representative Kayla Berg, I represent 55B, which is most of Burnsville. So more transportation fun for us today. Um, most of you on this committee, if not all, know how special alternative learning centers are to me. And so um, when we talk about making sure every student can have a world-class world education um, and can thrive, um, I think we need to have a special conversation about our alternative learning center kiddos um, who often face unimaginable barriers um, in their life. If you remember um, when my MAP uh, bill was here and Cameron, the young man, came and testified um, and was vulnerable about what was going on in his life and where he found um, purpose and uh, his pathway to a bright future was the Alternative Learning Center. And same thing with my own kiddo. So this is a bill um, that sort of looks at the barriers that our um, ALC students are facing and trying to remove one of those. So you have a good background about it uh, in your summary. Uh, but I will say, according to state law, except for a district located in a city of the first class, an area learning center must be established in cooperation with other districts and must serve the geographic area of at least two districts. 
As a result, students often must travel further distances to attend ALC programs. While current law allows districts to provide between building bus transportation along existing school bus routes, when space is available for pupils attending programs at an area learning center, they can only do so if it does not increase the district's expenditures for transportation. Currently, districts do not receive aid for transporting students outside of these parameters unless that student qualifies for special education services and attends an area learning center. Um, so, to be clear, this bill allows um, school districts to apply uh, for um, costs related to transporting students for the preceding fiscal year, and they apply to MDE for that. This is not a mandate that you must, uh, you know, ask for this funding. It's the district's choice. Um, and my understanding is a fiscal note has been requested, uh, but I, le I understand also that any questions could be addressed to um, Ms. Beckel. And I do have one testifier that I believe is remote. Thank you, Representative Berg. Uh, with that, we do have uh, Principal Michael Michelle Balland from Monomeda Academy. Please uh, state your name for the record and proceed. Good morning, I'm Michelle Balin. I'm a principal with uh, Intermediate District 916 and I oversee one of our alternative learning centers which is located in Madam Nidai. Uh, so I just wanna say thank you to Madam Chair and Representative Burke for the opportunity to testify today. Um, we currently have three ALCs within our 916 program. Uh, they are in Madam Nidai, Fridley and Little Canada. The Minnesota Department of Education states that the purpose of our approved alternative learning programs, our ALCs, is to provide viable education options to students who are experiencing difficulties in the traditional setting. They are designed to reduce barriers to success. However, the lack of support for our districts to fund transportation is directly impacting our ability to break down those barriers. Research and experience has confirmed that attendance has a direct and meaningful impact on student success. And by adequately supporting districts to provide that transportation to local alternative learning centers, you are removing that bar barrier that is currently in place. Currently, our district uh, in 916 ALCs, we have over 50% of our students who have chosen to enroll in our schools despite no transportation. These students are spending hundreds of dollars to take Ubers to and from school, or they get on the city buses, sometimes as early as 5.30 in the morning to get to school by eight o'clock. And that's if they come to school at all. If we are committed to providing ALCs as a viable option for our underserved populations, we must support the districts by funding the transportation needed to access the education. ALCs are unique small communities with, as the students say, a certain vibe. We have all felt that vibe somewhere, a place that feels like hope. Supporting districts in funding transportation is supporting students in finding hope. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Balland. Um, <coughs> members, any questions for the testifiers? Representative Berg. Everybody's sleepy this morning. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Representative Fryer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Th uh, thank you, Representative Berg, for you know allowing bringing this forward, and and thank thank you to your testifier for reminding us of what's out there right now, and and um, you know what the possibilities are for students that are really um, very much in need and need our support. Can you describe a little bit about kind of like the uh, the scope of um, when we do have a fiscal note? Would it um, it sounds like there's a great need. So what, are we meeting all the need or is this kind of just working towards meeting all the needs? Where are we on that, um, on that continuum of, of really addressing um, what we should be doing for these students? Representative Berg. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Pryor. Um, so without the fiscal note in my actual hand, I'm not sure. Um, however, um, 
this is something that each individual district can apply for, which means that likely some will not. Um, but I think if Ms. Beckel has any information on the scope of what we're asking for in the fiscal note, she would be uh, better suited. Ms. Beckel. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, I'm afraid I would have to get back to you with this information. Thank you, Ms. Beckel. Uh, Mr. Strom. Uh, Madam Chair and members, as Ms. Beckel said, we'll, we'll need the fiscal note, but a couple of numbers that are helpful you, to you perhaps. The department puts out a very nice report each year on alternative learning center programs. And while a number of students, a, a large number of students take summer school classes and those things through the ALCs, the number that are full-time enrolled, I think from the last report was about 10,000 or so. So you're, you're talking about 10,000 students. If you looked at Representative Hill's printout, uh, you'll see that the average expenditure was about $400 per pupil. So you could perhaps do a little math like that at the outset. My, my guess is that transporting students to an ALC is more expensive because the distances are further between the ALCs uh, than, to the, than to the nearest uh, school within a district but that probably gives you some range uh, of, of where you'd be probably in the mid millions. But until we get the fiscal note, it's really hard for us to give you anything with specificity. Thank you, Mr. Strom. Um, Representative Spencer Murrell. Yeah, and um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Representative Berg, for bringing this important bill. I think mine is just more of a, a general comment for both this bill and the bill that um, Representative Hill just presented. You know, myself, Representative Hudella, and Representative West are also all on the Transportation Committee. Um, and last week in the Transportation Committee, um, in honor of Rosa Parks' birthday, we had Transit Equity Day. Um, and we heard testimony from teachers and students during that just about their general struggles of getting to school. And so um, I, I'm just kind of wondering, I guess, about future collaboration between the Transportation Committee and the Education Committee, um, because I think that these seem like some temporary fixes, but you know, also having students have to commute, you know, an hour plus. I just don't know um, if that's the best way, kind of moving forward, or how we could maybe think differently about that. So more, just kind of future, big picture thinking. I would love for our two committees to be in more collaboration around this issue of how students are getting to school. Thank you, Representative Sensumer. I think that is a very good idea. Um, Mr. Strom, I had a quick question too. Uh, some of our kiddos that go to ALCs fall under um, special education. Is that funding provide transportation or Madam, not? Madam Chair, members, there is a component of special education funding that covers the cost of transporting special education services according to the criteria in their IEP um, and that provides transportation for homeless students. Those amounts go into the special education calculations uh, for many districts, those are 100% reimbursed, uh, but because of the complications in our special ed formula, not, not the case with all districts on that front. Uh, so some, some of the ALC transportation costs for special education students are covered in the, in the uh, series of regular special education formulas that, that the state has. Thank you, Mr. Strom. That's helpful. So I, I just bring this up because the fiscal note might be a little less than we think it is just because of that, but we just don't know. <laughs> so that's why we're gonna, uh, why we're laying this bill over for further discussion. Any other questions? Seeing none, Representative Berg, closing comments. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to, um, before I make my closing address, a couple of points. Thank you, Representative Censor Murrah, for um, grounding us in the in the fact that this is an equity issue, um, whether it is our our brown and black kiddos or our low income kiddos. Um, and any other uh, sort of description where there are barriers um, for students just doing their best and trying to get to school because that's actually what they want to do. Um, also on the point that kids are getting on the city buses or taking Ubers, there was one morning I couldn't get Jake to, uh, to his school and so I sent him down uh, to get an Uber and he came back up and he couldn't take an Uber because he wasn't 18. So that's also um, an additional barrier in instead of thinking that that's a solution. Um, so just in closing, 
Our alternative learning uh, programs are designed to help students achieve their educational and career goals in a non-traditional learning environment. A comprehensive and rigorous high school curriculum is delivered with a personalized, flexible, and nurturing environment to help students thrive. We often talk about gold standard and rigorous coursework, and we're not missing that with our alternative learning center kiddos. We're just approaching it in a different way. Um, these programs provide student assistance in meeting graduation requirements and have opportunities to gain vocational skills and work experience. So again, this bill is about removing the barriers for all of our kiddos uh, so they have a pathway to a bright future. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Berg. I renew my motion to lay over House File 994 for uh, uh, future inclusion in the uh, education finance bill. With that, members, I think we're Running up to our last bill now, we have, um, excuse me, last bill of the morning, I should say. That's bill 781, um, Representative Kosnick. <coughs> Representative Bennett, would you like to move House File 781 before the Committee for Possible Inclusion and in Education Bill? Thank you, Madam Chair, so moved. Thank you, Representative Bennett. With that, Representative Kosnick, welcome to the Education Committee and proceed. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. It's a pleasure to be here with the committee. I don't make this, uh, this isn't my first stop here, but uh, I don't make it to the Education Committee all that often. Um, but uh, this bill is uh, an example of just getting out in your community and talking with neighbors. I happened to last summer be at a neighborhood night out and um, a constituent that is uh, well-versed in education finance uh, emailed me uh, about this uh, particular issue and just simply uh, saves a little bit of regulation for the school districts and simplifies and aligns the minimum hours of instruction for full-time kindergarten pupils by removing the separate minimum hours requirement for a kindergarten pupil with a disability. And that is the bill, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Representative Kosnick. I think um, we have one testifier signed up here from the public, and I had forgotten to say on all our other bills, we put this out for the public to sign up to testify. I didn't have any other public testimony, um, but this one we do. So, uh, Doshoni with uh, MDE. Mr. Uni, please state your name for the record and proceed. Madam Chair, <coughs> pardon me. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Ado Shuni and I am the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Education. And thank you for the opportunity to provide support for this bill and to Representative Kosnick for carrying this proposal. This is a small but mighty ask. This may seem like a negligible uh, fiscal impact, but it is, uh, it is pretty meaningful. This bill will eliminate, as uh, Representative Kosnick mentioned, an unintended and inequitable disparity in funding between kindergarten students with a disability and other kindergarten students. When all day, everyday kindergarten funding was enacted in 2013, the uh, average daily membership ca uh, calculations, or ADM, for kindergarten students with a disability were inadvertently not updated to make them consistent with calculations for kindergarten students without a disability. Currently, kindergarten students with a disability generate slightly less general education revenue than their non-disabled peers, uh, peers who are served with the same number of hours during the fiscal year. To generate the same ADM, a kindergartner with a disability would have to receive 875 hours of service compared to other kindergartners who must receive 850 hours. For grades one through 12, ADM for students with a disability is calculated in the same manner as for students in the same grade level without a disability. This bill adjusts the average daily membership calculation for kindergarten students with a disability by making it the same as ADM calculation for other kindergarten students. Calculating uh, ADM for kindergarten students with a disability in the same manner as kindergarten students without a disability will also simplify the school finance system by eliminating a separate set of ADM calculations for these students. And I'll just note finally that this proposal is also in the governor's 2023 uh, budget, so we wholeheartedly support this effort. And so thank you very much for the opportunity to provide support for this bill. Thank you, Mr. Ernie. And uh, maybe I'll just kick my question over to Ms. Beckel. We will be getting a fiscal note for this as well. Uh, Madam Chair, um, this is in the governor's recommendations. So MDE has calculated the costs for this um, at 
$158,000 in the first biennium and $166,000 in the second biennium, just to make those adjustments. Thank you so much, Ms. Beckel. You always have the answer for me. Thank you. Um, I, I have to echo um, Mr. Uni's comments. This is a small but a mighty ask to make things equitable and just clean up some language that was left behind. So, members, are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Kosnick, what was your constituent's name that found this? Or uh, I did ask my constituent. Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Edelson, I did have uh, ask her if she wanted to testify today. Uh, she's out of town and unavailable. I can provide that to you afterwards. I don't know if she wants it to be public, but she's well versed in Minnesota education finance. Mm -hmm. If that's okay. Representative Kasnick. Representative Al Edelson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, clearly, we need to hire her in the state of Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Represent Representative Edelson. Uh, she served the state. Representative Kosnick, could you please go through the chair? Yeah, yeah so, <laughs> Representative Kosnick. Madam Chair, Representative Edelson, uh, she has served the state uh, quite admirably, but is now retired. <laughs> Representative Edelson, follow up. No. Thank you for the levity this morning. Um, any other questions? Seeing none, with that, I uh, will renew uh, Representative Bennett's motion to lay over House File 781 for possible inclusion in a... Oh, sorry, Representative Kosnick, I want to give you final words. Go ahead. I appreciate that, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the, uh, the chair and the committee's time this morning. Uh, I didn't realize it would be uh, a policy provision, but I know it's been uh, around in the education uh, for a while, the, the committee, and I appreciate that it's also uh, supported by MBE. So I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Representative Kosnick, and thank you for bringing it forward as well to our attention. So um, with that, Representative Bennett renews her motion for House File 781 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the Education Finance Bill. Um, with that, members, we have finished our morning agenda. We're posted our agenda for 7 o'clock tonight to hear House File 20 in the same room. So uh, with that, members, we stand in recess until 7 p.m. tonight.